Hey, it is time to quest. It is I, your editor. Quick, come, swiftly. Let's go. Where are you taking us? To the Lady of the Lake. She summons you. The Lady of the Lake? Liam, what are you talking about? The old world awaits. And who are you meant to be, Jen? I am the Lady of the Lake. Right. I present to you this sword. Strange ladies sitting by ponds distributing swords? That sounds like my kind of government. Thanks. Oh wait, there's one more thing. Games Workshop have sent us this. And this. And these as well. I guess we're doing Old World then. It's tabletop time! I want to answer the question, is this game dead on arrival? A lot of people have been talking about it and there's a real mix of disappointment and extreme hype. It's very peculiar and I haven't seen it in a long time where there's been this juxtaposition of like complete dislike or disinterest and obsessive love. So I'm gonna see what the fuss is about. I'm not a fantasy guy. Ari and Jenna hype, but they're not in for the year yet. Uh, I've just got back from, well, having the Rona. So um, <laughs> my first thing back is to look at this swag. Well, this is neat. Uh, I know you guys don't know the difference, but uh, this is new for us. This was so easy. And uh, for a reference so old, it could carbon date me. I'm, I'm Al. I'm Al from Home Improvement behind this wall of Old World. In this pre-order, there are the two boxes. We have one starter box focused entirely on Bretonia, one starter box focused on the Tomb Kings. This is pretty unique and they don't usually do this where we have basically entire armies or a good chunk of armies on their own with the rule book in a starter box. There's no splitting, there's no one for each person. And I gotta say, it feels like a gamble, but I really like it. We're gonna go first with the Tomb Kings of Kemri. Oh my god, they're so old. Oh, why do they exist? Copyright 1993! Talk about the old world, man. I gotta say one thing off the bat. Uh, I'm just gonna get it out of the air. This is not my cuppa. This is funny because Jen and Murray are really keen on it, but both of them are away this week. So I'm checking out the game and having a good look. And they're gonna be taking uh, you on the painting journey and actually taking these armies but for me I like new pretty models and these skeletons have always these skeletal horses always stood up as some of the oldest lamest just no when I was 13 to 15 I didn't get into fantasy and one of the reasons I didn't get into fantasy because half the minis were terrible and old I think that problems always plagued the tomb kings and in the old world with only some models getting plastics I think it's going to continue where Warhammer Fantasy Battle armies seem to be split between like half of a range of really nice minis and then um, some very old ones this brand new skeletal dragon thing only adds to that and lots of skulls <laughs> uh can't even. There they are. That's nostalgia. So fully half the box contents is this sprue. Four skeletons with spears or hand weapons uh, and no shields. So that's that much sprue. And then we got the sprues that have all the rest of the fun stuff. We got the cool shields. Really the things that made Tomb Kings actually interesting is their heads and their shields. Uh, and this is, well, this is a lot again uh, this is all the same sprue. We have three chariots. All the new stuff is contained on these two sprues. So this is the character, I think there's an infantry character and the big dragon mount thing, which is very cool, the crocodile dragon. But that's it for minis. We have a pile of skeletons, just uh, oodles of ancient skeleton models. I'm actually surprised by like just how much of the same thing there is in this box. I didn't realize, like it's really good if you want to build an army. I think Old World is all about that. Warhammer Fantasy was often about lots of lines and ranks of the same unit. But I think the way they can be built in different configurations uh, and the way they're presented on the box does make it feel like maybe there's a bit more to it than that. We have much nicer instructions, which is really good to see. Uh, the instructions have historically been pretty bad uh, Forge World, but then old, old World. So these are like the modern style. They're quite clear. They're quite nice. I think that's good. It's got a nice army list here, 1,250 points. So that's pretty cool with all the rules in the back just for playing these exactly as presented in the box. We got dice, famous square bases, copyright 2001, and the giant square 
which is 2010. So there you go. It's always interesting to see when these molds are from. So both of the starter boxes have the core book in it. So I'll move on to that next before the Bretons, but I wanted to get my thoughts across for the contents of this box. I think by Games Workshop standards, the value of the box in terms of how many minis you get is pretty good. But the caveat is, especially with the Tomb Kings box, these are ancient models. Like we're talking stamp 1993. These are 30 years old. And I think people don't care. Maybe I care for me. It's not for me. I, I can't imagine buying a box of 30 year old minis, but I'm not the old hammer guy. I love some stuff from back then, but I really like new sculpts. I, I really like just good sculpts. And I never thought the Tomb Kings chariots, horses, skeletons were their good sculpts. This is the chaff. This is the big box of discount chaff to bulk your army and then buy the interesting units later. So as a box containing everything you need to get started and an entire army for one player, I think that's really cool. For a modern Warhammer player, I, uh, yeah, it's not for me. The contrast between the two types of sprues is hilarious. The sheer quantity of stuff that you fit on a modern sprue versus a classic one. So looking through the books is a mix for me. It's a really cool experience. They seem pretty nicely laid out, like a really cool renewed presentation of the Warhammer fantasy battles I tangentially looked at when I was in the hobby in my youth. The book goes through the lore, covering up to the point of the story that they're starting to tell, which is quite a step back from the end times. This gives a lot of narrative freedom in an era of history of the game where there's space for them to explore campaigns and for you to tell your stories, which I think Think is pretty cool. A lot of the classic great art from Warhammer Fantasy Battle is represented here, as well as some old Citadel paint jobs in the display section. It really does feel like a relic of a bygone era. I spend a lot of time on the channel looking through old white dwarfs and things like that, and I've seen these models recently in old white dwarfs. <laughs> Alongside the rule book and for this release, we have these arcane journals that have come out. And when I looked at this and flicked through it, I was quite excited. I thought this was really cool. They're slimmed down about 50 pages, supplement books for your faction, effectively codexes or battle tomes. I flicked through, started looking at some unit entries for some of the new Forge World models, the actual really nice sculpts like Lady Elise de Shard. And I noticed that there's sort of armies of renown in here, allowing you to field some interesting differences to a standard Britain army or Tomb King's army. There's more focus on some heraldry, information, lore, and maps. That's all really cool to look at. Until I realized that a lot of the rules were missing. And then it became clear to me that this isn't an army book. This is an army supplement. So right off the bat with this game, you need to buy the army book for all of the quote unquote good guys, which isn't available on launch. And then buy the army book for the quote unquote bad guys. And then if you get a faction, you might, might if you are lucky, get a supplement book that has some extra cool stuff in it. And on the one hand, the broader rule book with all the rules in it is pretty cool. Cause it means if you've got multiple armies or old armies, you can play them or you can share with a friend, that's good. But then having a supplement on top already means that if I want to play Bretonians, I got to walk to a game with three books on day one, but I can't on day one cause I don't have the Bretonian army rules. They haven't come out yet. So I can't play on day one unless I just use the contents of the box. Yeah, it's something to be aware of that if you are getting this arcane journal, it's a supplement to a book that you, another book that you need to have. But I do want to say, I really like the graphic design. I really like the style. I really like the vibe. They've done a great job of recapturing uh, old classic Warhammer, then giving it a bit of a fresh new spin. So I think they're really nice little books. I think it looks cool. It will look great on the shelf, but I did find the day one DLC book a little bit odd. Would it have been hard to print all the Bretonian or Tomb Kings rules in these supplements. So if you just want to collect Bretonians on launch, you can just get this book and play Bretonians on launch. I haven't seen any information about free rules or war scrolls or whatever. So I don't think that's happening. So yeah, it's just uh, something to note. Next up on the unbox train, it's Bretonian time. Ow! Don't, <laughs> don't drop a box on your hand. These boxes are heavy. What the hell? Ah. Whippy sticks. 
That's obligatory. These are 40K templates. Copyright 1998, but I don't remember them being in uh, orange plastic in 98. This is odd. I don't understand the, the, the like little baggies. We get little, little baggies in these. Uh, like why aren't these on sprues? Were they sold in clam packs? All the cavalry uh, and the Pegasus bits are all on little sprues. Oh, oh, a new sprue, <laughs> a new kit. Oh, nice. Okay, a plastic Bretonian character. I actually prefer the stripped down design of the new models for Old World. I started Cities of Sigmar and I found them painful to paint. They're, there's too many, too much detail on peasants, like basic troops that are just layered in detail. This is a character and he's got about the same amount of like over clutter of detail as a standard steel helm from Cities of Sigma. And I think they've done that to make them fit in with the older models. And I think it's a great choice. Don't change, keep producing your models to just be a lot more paintable. All right, so here's where we get into the same world as the Tomb Kings. We have some lovely Bretonian men at arms, circa 2003. And we have a lot of them. Seven, so I'm gonna assume eight. Command sprues and knightly bits and bobs. A few sprues of knights. We have the glorious Pegasus man, the new Pegasus. This is the mount half where that original character I was showing off, this is the dude that goes on top. So together we have our new, single new character in the box. I will say, I actually think the Bretonians hold up a lot better. I don't really mind these models. The old skeletons, because they're skeletons and there was a minimum size that they could physically cast models, they just have always had weird proportions that the new skeletons completely avoid. Whereas the older Bretonian models, they actually hold up a lot better uh, than I thought. The rest of the box contains uh, the same stuff as the Tomb Kings, but that's what's inside. So we have three knightly sprues, seven Bretonian peasant sprues, four Bretonian archer sprues, three command sprues, three sprues of horses, a miscellaneous baggies of horses and Pegasus night bits, and our chief character, who is very cool. Also in the first wave of model releases that are plastic, we didn't get sent any of the Forge World kits and honestly, uh, they're the stuff we love. Jen was desperate to paint Lady Elise de Shard and also the handmade model. They're looking lovely. And some of the Bretonian new knights on foot are gorgeous as well. Really nice resin models. But the Royal Standard Bearer Pegasus Man, he's here and he has a gorgeous 80s moustache, which is just fantastic. So my mind is truly boggled. Uh, this is the exact same mount, but the second sprue with the rider is different. So yeah, so if you want the standard bearer, you just get the standard bearer, but everything else is the same. It's just the same sprue. You know, it's actually super interesting having these both uh, in hand. First of all, it's a nice model. I like his mustache. The sprue for the character, the commander from the starter box is labeled sprue B. And the sprue from the banner bearer is labeled sprue A. The Pegasus sprue actually doesn't have a label on it. It doesn't have a letter code anywhere that I can see. But what's interesting is the process of elimination says, if sprue A is the banner bearer, this can't be sprue A. So if the knight on horseback on Pegasus is sprue B, process of elimination says, the Pegasus is Sprue C, which means at some point they decided not to put the options in because Sprue A, B and C is how you'd make a kit. It seems bizarre that there'd be Sprue A and B, but they're split into different kits. So I don't know what to think of that. That's just a theory. That's a, allegedly an allegation. Oh, wow. These instructions though. I take back what I said about the good instruction manuals. This is... It's okay. There's two more things. We're gonna be quick with them though. We have, it's modular movement trays. And a map. This is actually cool. I was really hoping they'd be like the Horus Heresy map I, when I saw we were getting sent this and it would be like this gorgeous map in a leather tube. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be to that level. Seems a little bit more like a map, quite a nice map, but a fold out map from like a tourist center. It's big, at least it's big. Now this is pretty cool. 
I would be kind of irritated that my map is folded, but I guess uh, that's a pretty cool vibe if you're going for like a, a like a fold out map on a table. It looks kind of realistic in that it's folded, but it's cool. It's a map of the old world. It's a map of the focal points of this this part of the game. If you like maps, here you go. Uh, only caveat is it will be delivered folded up. You know what unboxing videos are like. We got this two days prior to launch, so. This video goes out on Saturday. It's Wednesday. We received the package at 3 p.m. So we've got to edit a video too. But I've stewed. I've stewed for too long. Uh, we got to talk about this. So I am the impartial guy. I had no real thoughts coming into it. But looking through these boxes, I see a lot of love poured into a game for people who really care about the old world. From that side of it, it seems really cool. But I also see a whole bunch of really, really old models that were so old when I was first looking at Warhammer Fan fantasy battles, I didn't want to collect them then. So why would I get them now? Is it for the old fans of Warhammer? It could be argued didn't support the game enough to keep it alive in the first place. I know, I already can hear it. If the sales were good, Games Workshop would have kept making it. It's as simple as that. And your individual love for the game, if you feel triggered by that statement, and your personal support of the game is not indicative of the wider community at large for Warhammer Fantasy. So you're someone who never got into Warhammer Fantasy. Is there any appeal to Old World for you? Oh, absolutely. I think originally I wanted to collect Wood Elves. That was the one army I wanted, but then Age of Sigma came out and I collected Savannah instead. That means the Wood Elf minis don't exist anymore, but I'm super keen if they come back. Is it like a nostalgic desire to collect minis that are no longer available for sale? Is that the appeal? I'm trying to dig what, what is the point of this game? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is. I think it's to try and capture this like old feel of Warhammer, what it originally used to be and what fans maybe want again. If you couldn't collect it back when it came out, well now you have the chance to. Even if they're older minis, some people like that nostalgia. Yeah, I think that's where I'm trying to figure everything out because this game doesn't look like it's going to be this huge range release. It's not going to get full scale plastic kit supports unless a lot of people buy it and it's really popular. And even then the Games Workshop cycle is what, three years? So it really seems to be game for people who are nostalgic about Warhammer Fantasy but maybe didn't get into it because if you did get into it probably already have an army right? So I also know you've got a little bit of a hang up on the older models but I truly believe that any paint job can save away an old model look so why don't we paint some up? Look I'm willing to paint a Bretonian man at arms they seem kind of cool and let's see if actually painting one of these models that I've looked at and just kind of shrugged at is good and while we paint these models uh, uh, on camera, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think the old world is and what I think is going to happen. Let's do it. So as you suggested, we're going to give painting a crack and this is fun. This is the first time we've ever used this rig setup. Uh, despite how it looks, this is actually way better than it was before. There was stuff that was sort of behind the scenes that really constricted how much movement we had. So this is so much better. Well, the fact of the matter is we're sitting both side by side at the table, which we literally couldn't do before. Mm. And uh, I think it's interesting. We had a few comments on our rig setup video that are like, you've reduced the usable space. Uh, I don't think it showed on camera. Like my elbows are on the table. Table and at full extension, it's just just hitting the rig. So we should have more space uh, than you'd think. It's still snug. It's a snug environment, but um, I'm excited to get working. However, if I'm going to paint a million Bretonians, uh, I'm not painting them slowly. So I'm going to only do maybe like an hour because mm. uh, I want to see what you can get done on these old models quickly. Mm. Well, luckily enough, my guys are pretty much skeletons. So all I have to paint is skeletons. Uh, I think I've got it uh, pretty easy compared to you. So we should get to it. Let's do it. I'm gonna start with something really wild and completely unfounded. I think the Middle Earth strategy battle game is going to wrap up. I know it is widely reported as one of the best games Games Workshop's ever made, and I know people love it, but it is a licensed game and Games Workshop don't really do that anymore at least. It's been over 20 years since those films were out in cinemas. The Hobbit gave a bit of a boost, but it was never the same heights that the Lord of the Rings movie series had garnered. Now, whether it's due to waning interest, a difficulty of bringing in new customers, a license expiry, or Games Workshop wanting a fatter profit margin and not having to pay licensing fees, I have a feeling they're looking to create a game that fits just about the same production schedule and design schedule as Lord of the Rings strategy battle game, but is their own fully controlled world and IP. 
I think the more granular battle recreation and historic elements are quite similar in the new look of the game's regiments of renown and armies being presented in the old world. This seems similar to the way the Lord of the Rings game encourages you to recreate battles from the movies, etc. Now, while the games are vastly different and I'm not suggesting they aren't, and I don't want Lord of the Rings to be squatted. I, I seriously don't. I just have a gut feeling. When you look at the way that these models are released, we're looking at some big box releases, repackaging a lot of older plastics with maybe one new character model in plastic, and then most of the range being supported in Forge World resin character models. That model perfectly fits the way Lord of the Rings has been supported for a long time. And I have a feeling that people wanted the old world to be a lot more like the Horus Heresy, but it's really worth establishing. It took 10 years for the Horus Heresy to earn the plastic release it has recently received and even then people aren't happy with the scope of it. Without certain infantry types on launch and with factional support for things that aren't Space Marines seeming fairly weak. Horus Heresy started as a passion project that grew to be this huge thing because it was really good and really well loved. The Forge World range expanded to beyond what I think anyone ever estimated and pushed Forge World into something I don't think it was ever meant to be. Fully produced an entire game mostly in resin. The old world hasn't earned that support. From Games Workshop's point of view, we have a game that failed. Warhammer Fantasy didn't make enough money to continue producing, so as with all of their new ventures, it's a bit of a gamble for them to bring it back. So I can see Forge World supporting the old world in the way they used to support Horus Heresy. And I can also see, as I said, Lord of the Rings sailing off into the West. But whether Lord of the Rings stays or goes, I think the more important thing is my prediction is the old world will be supported in the same way as the Lord of the Rings currently is. You're gonna get occasional resin models and occasional plastic boxes, but it's not gonna look like the Horus Heresy. Now that could change with a whole lot of support. The second thing I really wanted to touch on is compatibility. There is a list of factions, legacy factions that they've stated are not being included in the old world and are getting PDFs. You can use them in games, but they're not gonna get supported. I think it's very interesting that this list of factions perfectly coincides with the factions from the old world that have been adapted and continued to be used in Age of Sigma. Games Workshop do not want you putting your models on bases and using them in two different systems. They want you to buy two different armies. With the exception of Chaos Dwarves, which may just be old Forge World and not being supported at all anymore, we have armies such as the Skaven, who everyone assumes are gonna be coming out with a full update very soon for Age of Sigma. Vampire counts have evolved into their own thing. Lizard men have had an entire new range update. And Dark Elves are something that's been rumored for a very long time and may too come to Age of Sigma. My gut is this list of factions are the survivors. The ones that they're gonna keep using parts of their range for in Age of Sigma, but then update. And anything left in Old World, you'll notice, is distinctly Old World. We had to wait before Empire State Troops became Cities of Sigma before the Old World came out. Although this could probably seem like a bad thing, in a way, if you've ever wanted to collect these armies and they become accessible to you, well, at least now you can. I really liked Tomb Kings when they came out and I think a few of us at the start were hopeful it would come out for Age of Sigma, but well, they never did. And instead, Old World came out. If you do love these armies, at least you do have a way to be able to collect them and paint them, build them and play with them as well. It does seem like no mistake that the launch factions are Bretonia and Tomb Kings, which are the two two factions that were effectively squatted out of the game and not available in Age of Sigma. You've been able to buy old Empire handgunners up until very, very recently, but you haven't been able to buy the Tomb Kings and Bretons for a decade. And I think this is why they're the launch factions, regardless of the amount of support they've gotten. I, for one, would love to see more than anything else in all of Warhammer, Wood Elves get some really cool updates. I love Wood Elves and High Elves as well, and seeing more stuff for that would be awesome. If anything, I'm using this list as a bit of excitement because it means that Skaven are probably on the way for Age of Sigma, and it means that things like Dark Elves are being kept for Age of Sigma as well, which is super cool. And think about it, we've already got Daughters of Cain, which were Dark Elves units, and they're being used as Daughters of Cain, so it's quite clear that the crossover is non-existent here. Now let us know in the comments below about what you think about Old World and the changes that they're gonna make. Now, over this course, we've been painting our model, and I have to say, I've shocked myself. I've enjoyed this Breton a lot. He's been so fun to paint, and I think the lack of chucking everything in the kitchen sink into the model sculpt has been what's helped me to enjoy it. It's nice to paint a model that 
doesn't take 14 hours to paint because it has a million useless bits on it. And I actually found that I wanted to collect Cedars of Sigma, but after painting a handful of their troops, I wasn't into it. They were just too complicated. They were too hard to paint. Just too time consuming for a, a chaff troop that costs no points. This Breton's been super cool and it's actually been fun to paint and the sculptors turned out a lot nicer with a modern paint job. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I actually really loved making my little skelly man. There is a ton of mold lines on these miniatures, oh, yeah. so please <laughs> be mindful if you do decide to build these for yourself. But if you can deal with the mold lines, the posability is actually something I missed from the old Warhammer kits that you can get in this one. Sure, some of your options are a little bit tedious, but you're able to pose him in however position you want. And I really love this customization. It allows me to make basic troops look a little bit different from each other. So Games Workshop has sent us so much stuff for Old World. We would kind of feel bad not to do a little bit more with it. And I know Mari has been itching to paint that Bretonian Pegasus. <laughs> so in January, we're going to be doing a bunch more videos and we're going to be focusing mostly on Legions Imperialis and on Old World. So for January of this year, we're going retro, we're going 80s and 90s as we revisit the new versions of those classic games. So I hope you enjoy the ride. Uh, Mari's going to be excited. You're going to paint that Tomb King Dragon? Oh my god, I'm so excited. That thing looks sick. And that's something I love too, is that they're putting new minis in there too. Yes, more please. Send yes. us send us Alice to Shah. Jen wants, <laughs> yes. Jen wants Princess on Unicorn. Unicorn. Not technically a princess, but Gen 1's princess on Unicorn. Okay, uh, that's that's it. Uh, but hey, you haven't seen our models yet, so um, check out these reveals. I'd like to thank our patrons for supporting us and allowing us to make these videos. Your support is super fantastic. We do a weekly behind the scenes video that is exclusive to Patreon where we talk about our previous releases, our upcoming releases, and basically just the vibe in the studio. It's a candid little look behind the scenes at my Monday morning experience. As well as that, we have a monthly mini review and a Discord for our patrons, so make sure to check it out if you want to get involved. You've all seen the reveals now and the biggest surprise to me in the whole process is how much fun I had. I had so much more fun painting this Bretonian than any of the Cities of Sigma models and that was a huge shock to me. I think what I realized is that Games Workshop really can be prone to putting too much detail on a model and I always feel like I'm diffusing a bomb as I try and paint some tiny, tiny detail next to some other detail and 14 different textures. And this classic Bretonian model with some modern paint styles painted really quickly turned out well pretty well I'm happy with this am I going to start collecting old world no it was really fun painting one Bretonian not fun painting 80 Bretonians I get it though this is cool and I guess old models aren't that bad Jen was right so Liam Thank you very much for taking me on this quest. I can see from the fact that you've handmade this entire Bretonian costume. Thank you for introducing me to your world. And uh, what's, what, what are you doing now? Are you just... Your quest is complete, but mine must continue. I'm also taking this. Uh, what? It's mine now. Don't you have to edit the video? My journey takes me elsewhere. Oh well. What do you, what do you mean? Where are you going? I have a new job now. There's a new editor. Be nice to him. Okay, bye. But that's <laughs> one of them. Oh my god. If you're doing more battle reports, I might return, but probably like a ghost. I don't know. Depends. In this outfit, though, you look really warm. Um. Go on your quest. I still have to finish. Go on the your video. quest. Go on your glorious quest. Go, quest. Be gone, quest person. Yeah, get out of here, questy. <laughs> questy? Get out of here, questy. questy. I'm a knight errant. I'm going on a quest. Go on, go quest. Where's these? A cup. No. <laughs> Whatever, I'm out of here. See you later, questy. Don't look at me. Get out of here. Look at, look at them. All right, now don't let him hear me 
uh, say that I say this, but um, everyone give Liam some love in the comments. He's done an amazing job over this past year working with us at Tabletop Time and uh, we're really sorry and sad to see him go, but he has found uh, a fantastic dream position for him. So yeah, give Liam some love in the comments. We're gonna miss him. And uh, obviously we like having a joke around the studio who's been great fun to have here and a great resource and a great editor. Things move on and I'm really glad that he's going on to do something uh, that he loves. Editors have other job opportunities, unlike us YouTubers, it's this or barista work. So um, please keep watching our videos, please. <laughs>